All right, I'll take it then. Yeah, yeah. Throw it up. So uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Let, we well, let's begin by asking how many people are familiar with Game of Thrones? Have at least seen some of Game of Thrones. Fair number of people. About half, I'd say. That's good. That works. Um, how many people have uh, been to Ireland? Handful or know mm. roughly where Ireland might be on a map. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that. We'll take. We can work with that. There's a quiz coming up. So there is a quiz. That. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit uh, about this. this. This was a project that uh, Dr. Debies Carl and I uh, came to. Uh, my my interest is in Irish culture, Irish literature. Uh, and um, Dr. Debies Carl has done some work in, in the sociology of tourism. Uh, and we found this interesting point of connection when we uh, looked at kind of a phenomenon that was happening in Ireland uh, over the past couple of years. So uh, let's begin by telling you a little bit about the phenomenon. Uh, Northern Ireland is a separate country from the Republic of Ireland, right? Uh, it's still part of the United Kingdom, at least until they Brexit. <laughs> Uh, and then I'm sure they'll have a vote about that. <laughs> well said. Uh, but uh, something to know about. Uh, tourism in Northern Ireland has been problematic for a very long time for reasons you might, if you know the politics of, of the island, you, you know it was a fairly uh, war-torn area. Uh, and so tourism has struggled there. Uh, the major attractions over the past 20 years, there's a very popular golf course there that Tiger Woods says is his favorite golf course in the world, so that gets a lot of tourism. And other than that, the biggest tourism has been for the Titanic. Uh, the Titanic was built in Belfast. Uh, and so people like to go to see the empty space where the Titanic used to be. Um, uh, a while ago, um, in order to kind of ramp up the economy, Northern Ireland built a new film studio in Belfast at the exact location where the empty space where the Titanic used to be. And it's called Titanic Studios. Uh, they had put in a fairly, a Northern Ireland screen had put in a bid uh, to bring HBO there to film Game of Thrones. They, uh, several other countries put a bid on this uh, and Northern Ireland um, kind of won the bid. So Game of Thrones films here at Titanic Studios in Northern Ireland. Um, the trick here, um, the tourism related to Game of Thrones was not expected. Nobody expected people to come see Game of Thrones, uh, it took everyone by surprise. What, what started happening was as people were visiting Northern Ireland for other reasons, going up the Antrim coast, going to the Giant's Causeway, they were asking tour bus drivers to detour to go and visit these locations from Game of Thrones. Now, you can't visit Titanic Studios. It's a closed movie set. Nobody can go there. Um, however, there's all that outdoor filming. A great deal of Game of Thrones films outdoors in Northern Ireland. Some of it films in Croatia and Iceland as well. Uh, but many of the famous locations are in Northern Ireland. People realized if we divert from the Giant's Causeway for 15 minutes, we can go see that ditch in the road <laughs> where, you know, Jamie Lannister lost his hand. And buy a shirt that says, I saw a ditch. Yeah, and I saw a <laughs> ditch. So tour bus drivers started getting asked to detour and being the warm, hospitable people that they are in Northern Ireland, they said, sure, I'll take you to see a ditch. <laughs> uh, that evolved into official Game of Thrones tourism in Northern Ireland. Now you can purchase Game of Thrones tour packages. Uh, you can uh, visit a variety of locations. If you go, I mean, the, the competition is pretty significant. There's at least uh, seven or eight major tour companies doing Game of Thrones tours in Northern Ireland. Uh, and they will be happy to take you to all sorts of locations around Belfast that you know and love from the TV show. Uh, a lot of this is sponsored by the Northern Irish government as well. Um, the tour uh, buses, uh, often uh, they have pictures of direwolves on them to make you feel happy. Uh, and uh, they are often being led by people who have been extras on Game of Thrones to give you that, you know, if you wanted to know third soldier from the left who died in episode 14, he would be happy to tell you about his experience of 30 seconds of fame. <laughs> and uh, this became huge. Now, Game of Thrones in general has transformed Northern Ireland's economy. Um, it has uh, yielded $170 million 
in revenue for Northern Ireland, 900 full-time jobs, 5,700 part-time jobs. Northern Ireland is not a big country, so that's fairly significant. Uh, and this goes from everything from people involved with the direct production to artisans who are making horse saddles and um, people making broadswords <laughs> and armor. Uh, it, it has been a tremendous boon to the economy, but the, the tourism has been interesting. Uh, right now, tourism in, in Northern Ireland accounts for 5.2% of their GDP. That is substantial. What year did this start? Like, did hmm. they really start generating uh, tourists? Uh, they, they began organizing the tours about a couple years after the show went on the air. Uh, not, it wasn't during the first year because they didn't expect anyone to care. Uh, but at this point, the, in the, by 2020, they expect that the GDP generated from tourism is going to double. It'll be over 10%. And they're basing that on what happened to New Zealand after production of Lord of the Rings, uh, where their economy uh, faced a similar kind of boom. So what do you get? You want to go, right, Mackenzie? You want to go. So you want to know what you would get if you go on one of these tours. How cool? and or not cool is it? So you can visit the Dark Hedges, which is um, a, a popular Irish destination. People are very beautiful. Unfortunately, there has been um, an environmental problem there that has killed a bunch of the trees recently. But those of you who are Game of Thrones fan probably recognize it as the King's Road. Um, but you can go see there. You can drive through the trees. You can pretend you're Robert Baratheon on his way to go find yourself a hand of the king. You can go to Dunluce Castle, which is, uh, is the actual Castle Greyjoy from the show uh, in the Iron Islands, and you can um, pretend you're a Kraken, right? Yeah, I, I call that a Tuesday. That's Tuesday. <laughs> you can visit Winterfell, uh, which is Castle Ward in Northern Ireland, and people can go there, and uh, you can see they use a little Hollywood magic to make it look a little less modern. Uh, on the show. They took away the garage, for instance. <laughs> uh, but you can go check out the, the castle where all the excitement happens. My favorite, here's the ditch in the ground. Um, Magramorn Quarry, which is just a quarry, a rock quarry, uh, that this is the, where everyone wanted to go, um, is just the remains of a quarry where they spray painted a wall white and pretended it's castle black and it's the, the wall of ice at the north. Um, so you can go check that out, because it's outdoors, who's going to stop you? But it's, it's, it's ugly. <laughs> and it's now one of the most popular tourist destinations in Ireland. A hole in the ground that nobody visited for 50 years. But that's not enough for me. I want to see, I want to do more than see cool stuff. You want to do more than oh, see yeah, cool stuff. You know I want to do cool stuff if I'm in Northern Ireland. It's not enough for me to visit. I want to get beheaded. <laughs> At least once, right? <laughs> you think I'm joking? That is one of the add-ons for your tour package. Would you like to be beheaded as they do in Game of Thrones? Then we, they can arrange that for you. Costs extra, but... You know. uh, costs extra. Do you want to have archery lessons or sword fighting lessons? They can make that happen. Uh, do you want to camp out overnight? You guys like camping? Some people are like, I don't like to sleep on the ground. They do have glamping versions. <laughs> Now, if you're going to camp out overnight, they do expect you to wear uh, costumes that are appropriate for Game of Thrones, and you will pretend you are in a battle camp. Uh, you'll eat around a cook fire. Uh, you'll get to enjoy uh, mutton and pheasant. Wait till they show you the latrines. Yeah, the latrines are exciting. A treat. Um, the uh, other things that are included in the activities, uh, you get the full-on banquet. There, there is Game of Thrones fe themed beer and mead and wine, uh, and it, it takes on, a, those of you who are familiar with cosplay, it has an element of cosplay to it where people are pretending uh, they are very much in the world of Westeros. Good times. How many people like doggies? You want to meet the direwolves, right? You can. So if you go on the website, they're like, meet the actual direwolves. And you're like, those things are supposed to be like 12 feet tall and they're actually just a couple of dogs tied to a stump, which is sad. This is one of the sadder photos. <laughs> but um, yeah. 
<laughs> but uh, you can meet the dire wolves, you can pet a dire wolf. You've always dreamed of petting a dire wolf your whole life. Here's your chance on the tour package. Of course, when you go, when you go on vacation, you go somewhere exciting, you take photos, right? Who's been on vacation recently, gone somewhere exciting? You went to Denver, did you take pictures? Yeah. Selfies? Yeah. Okay, and if you go to a famous location, like you go to the Eiffel Tower, you go to... Um, London Eye. Where? The London Eye. The London Eye, you take a picture of it, right? So, of course, when, fa when fans begin interacting with the environment, I am not surprised that someone wants to take their picture mm -hmm. at the Dark Hedges. Or they want to stand where Theon Greyjoy st stood when he was still a man. And, and take their picture there as well. Um, I remember going to uh, Santa Monica, California, and the uh, carousel that's there that's in The Sting. How many people, you know the movie The Sting? Fantastic Paul Newman movie. I was like, this is, this is the carousel. Of course I'm going to take a picture of the carousel. And I'm sure other people have had reactions like that where you're in Grand Central Station and you're like, this is where from the Fisher King where Robin Williams had that ball dancing scene, or more likely for you guys, it's where Hulk punched Thor. Um, <laughs> but, or you go to, um, you know, I, when I was living in Boston, uh, Goodwill Hunting came out and lots of people were obsessed with the, the, the duck of the swan boat tour and they like to go and take a picture of the bench where, where uh, Robin Williams and Matt Damon had their conversation. I get it. Nothing weird about this, right? We're all good with this? Nobody has a problem? Okay. Let's move on. What about restaging shots from the show? So one thing that has started happening is, and the top here is a scene uh, from the show um, where Sansa's at the end of a pier and, and her, uh, one of her ladies in waiting is mournfully, wistfully looking into the distance. People have begun wanting to restage poses. Cool? Yeah, yeah, it would be like yeah. people doing that on the King of the <laughs> King World. Of the world. Um, I, I, you know how many people have done that on a cruise ship? I bet a lot. So maybe not that weird is what you're saying. We're good? Okay, let's ramp up the weirdness. What about if I go somewhere where they film the scene and I take a picture or my I, I, iPad with a still from that thing and I try to line it up so that instead of actually looking at the location, I'm looking at the picture contextualizing the location. Is that weird? Mm -hmm. Mackenzie, that's weird? Starting. Starting to get weird? Moving in the right direction. Moving in the right direction? We could do better. <laughs> or the wrong direction. <laughs> Has anyone done this? No. Does it strike you as weird, Allie? <laughs> you feel you feel I'm setting you up. This is what you do. This is what I do as a teacher. So um, this started happening, and tour guides started noticing people showing up with either iPads or books. They'd go to the bridge. This is a bridge where Jamie actually, I think, loses his hand, in, and and that also costs extra, by the way. And uh, when Dr. D.B.'s Carl and I were talking about this phenomena, I, I mentioned, uh, I've seen this a lot at concerts. Have you guys seen this? Where uh, people are watching, let's say, Taylor Swift. Not that I've ever been to a Taylor Swift. No, concert. no, not once. <laughs> and instead of actually watching Taylor Swift, they're watching their iPhone watch Taylor Swift. It seems to me somewhat similar, uh, but they're actually obscuring the environment in order to experience simulation. It's like they don't want to see the actual bridge. They want to see what the bridge kind of was in fantasy. Right? They're at the bridge, They're at the bridge but they want to see Jamie <laughs> and Brienne. Kind of like Pokemon Go. Oh, yeah. yeah yes. Perpetuating the fantasy into the environment. It is perpetuating the fantasy into the environment. Well said. So uh, some people were doing this without I iPads. They were doing it with uh, just photographs and so uh, it wasn't just one random person. This is happening a lot. Uh, people are going to the locations and like, I am here, like literally you see these poses like, I am here where they were in the TV show. I am in Westeros. Uh, you even get little kids doing it, which is what I would make my daughter do. <laughs> um, and in fact, one guy online um, 
<laughs> all of his vacation photos to Northern Ireland were this. They were like, I was here, I was here, I was here, I was here. Just so you know that he was in all the locations where Game of Thrones films. Um, okay. That starts to seem a little bit different. Are, are they really seeing the locations anymore? Or are they just seeing the fantasy that's intruding into the location? I believe this turns over to you. Well, you can continue if you like. You no, I want you to talk a bit. So it's become popular to kind of bash these sorts of practices because some of them do seem a little strange, right? Even if we might secretly want to do some ourselves. Yeah. We would never admit to it. Uh, but nonetheless, the, the study of this sort of thing is actually quite old. Sociologists have been studying tourism for since at least the 70s and made a lot of sense out of some of this stuff. So I just want to give you an example of how this makes perfect sense from the fan's point of view, uh, although things get truly bizarre when we move beyond the individual perspective. So why do tourism? Why go on these trips? Why see these things? Why get a t-shirt that says, I saw this ditch? Uh, some of it does actually sort of make sense. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons though, right? If I asked you all, even if you all went to the same place, you all went to the Eiffel Tower and I interviewed you afterwards, you might not all have gone for the same reasons, right? But I'd probably find a handful of reasons that we all share to a certain extent. So one of the reasons we engage in tourism uh, is this desire to experience something different, right? Something that takes us away from our everyday lives. You certainly see that with the Game of Thrones tourism, right? Uh, and there's some debate over whether uh, we really want to, to see authentic ways of life that differ from our own. Uh, McConnell suggested that's what we were trying to do, but that we could never really do it because wherever we go, reality is kind of staged. Like, is that a real elephant? I don't know. They might just put it there for the tourists. Uh, or maybe we don't really care if it's real or not. We just want to see something different. Like when we go to Epcot Center, we know we're not really seeing Germany, right? But we're still seeing something different from what we saw back home. So either way, new stuff, tourism. Why leave home? See something you can't see at home. Sometimes our motivations are a little deeper though, right? A lot of people go on tourist trips like this uh, to experience a deeper level of meaning, of importance in their life. So famously, the Camino de Santiago uh, is this pilgrimage route, which many people still take to this day, either the whole thing or part of it, or they just go right to the end. Uh, you go see the reputed resting place of an apostle. And especially if you're a religious person, this could be deeply meaningful for you. You feel a sense of connection uh, with the apostle and with your faith. It doesn't necessarily have to be religious, though. You could go up to Boston, right? Anybody go up to Boston, walk the Freedom Trail, or at least parts of it? Yeah, that's kind of meaningful too, right? Not in the same sort of way, but kind of quasi-religious, isn't it? Kind of patriotic. So this makes a lot of sense, doing these sorts of things. Uh, in fact, um, anthropologists have often compared tourists to religious pilgrims. Um, one famous anthropologist, Victor Turner, said that a pilgrim is half a tourist if a tourist is half a pilgrim. It's kind of right. What's the difference between a pilgrim and a tourist when we're considering things like this? Uh, likewise, maybe it's not so much about the place per se, but you're trying to get a deeper connection with something, like an author who's passed away. I can't meet Mark Twain, he's gone, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm not really well experienced in the arts of necromancy, but I could go see where he lived for a long time, right? And I could get a sort of sense of connection. Or I could go see where Edgar Allan Poe was buried, speaking of necromancy, right? Uh, down in Baltimore, and you might feel sort of a connection in this way that you can't get just from reading the book, maybe a combination of the two. Uh, likewise, maybe it has nothing to do with the place, it has nothing to do with a particular thing that you want to get close to, but you want to be around like-minded people. This is really evident in things like Comic-Cons and other conventions. This could take place anywhere, actually, right? Uh, the reason you're there is partly to be around people who share a similar interest to y with you. Uh, or maybe, as we see from some of this stuff that Dr. Da was talking about, you want to <coughs> dive in a little deeper. Reading the text is one thing, visiting the site of the text is another, but participating takes you a step even further. So this is where someone like cosplay would certainly come in. Uh, this picture is from a, a course we taught a couple of years ago on, on the cultures of, and literature of fandom. Uh, and so certainly we could, we could imagine what would impel somebody to want to do this sort of thing. Or maybe you want to write your own fan fiction. You enjoy that world so much uh, that you want to participate in its creation, not just as a character, but as a producer of it in some way. So all these sorts of things make a lot of sense, actually, uh, even when we see the apparently strangest of fan activities. But let's up the weirdness a little bit. So moving beyond the individual fan, right? Maybe there, I bet you every single one of you has something like this that you'd like to do to some extent. Maybe you don't want to dress up like a stormtrooper. Maybe you do. Uh, <laughs> it's possible. But there's something you'd like to visit or do in regards to some TV show or story. Yeah, not all of it is genre-oriented. Like, I remember my mom was obsessed with going to Graceland. 
Um, it was like a lifelong touristy dream and a pilgrimage to Graceland. It was. It was very much and uh, so and but there's equivalence to this in music, sports, everything. Absolutely. So the individual level makes sense, but what about in the larger state of affairs? Um, I need to remind you of a couple of concepts before we move into that then. You'll recall from your history lessons back in the day that once upon a time, uh, European powers in particular were fond of sailing around the globe, looking for people who didn't have as many guns as them, uh, forcing those people to work for them, stealing their resources or selling them junk that they couldn't sell at home. And we call this, of course, colonialism, right? And this was how our own country was founded. So colonialism of that sort largely went the way of the dodo in the 20th century, uh, but this doesn't mean that the poorer countries are, no, are totally free from the rich and powerful countries, right? You've perhaps heard the term neo-colonialism, new colonialism. The idea here is that these, these powerful nations still control the less powerful, less wealthy nations, but they do so through wealth, through controlling the world market and things like this. So they use their capital to exploit these other places. And it's not always other, just countries. There's often non-governmental actors involved like the World Trade Organization, uh, multinational corporations. You've heard this stuff before. So they're basically doing the same thing. They're finding less wealthy, less powerful nations. They're using them for cheap labor, for cheap resources to sell cheap goods to, essentially exploiting them economically for their own benefit and maintaining that underdevelopment. You don't want to help the poor countries of the world develop and become rich because then you can't exploit them anymore. This is called neo-colonialism and it's alive and well. Now the reason we're talking about this of course is because tourism might be playing a role in that process. When you go to these places you may not think of yourself as the colonial conqueror but you might be contributing to that process nonetheless. So we're gonna to try to get a sense of how this might work and see how or if this actually fits our case in Ireland these days, because it's not exactly the same scenario. So one of the problems with this is economic loss for the countries that experience tourism, believe it or not. In other words, you could think of a country, and I'll tell you a case study in a moment here, that really needs money, right? What do you do? You could grow crops, you could try to manufacture things, or you could attract rich tourists to come and spend money in your country, and this is what many of them do. They often don't have the cash to build up that infrastructure themselves, so they try to get a foreign company to do it for them and share the profits. But you gotta attract those people, right? You gotta make it pretty for them. So you give them tax incentives, you give them control over the process, let them have free reign in your country more or less. Uh, and this is exactly what winds up happening. So a foreign company comes in, builds up its tourist uh, industry, its tourist infrastructure, according to its own specifications, what benefits them most. And lo and behold, most of the profits from that go right back to the investors in the rich nations. Most of it does not stay in that poor country uh, because of these favorable deals. So while the country will become dependent on what little money they get from this sort of stuff, uh, it actually doesn't help them all that much. They are still dependent on a foreign power in this way. I'll give you a case study just to illustrate. So Kenya is kind of a textbook case study like this, right? It was a uh, colonial uh, territory for a long time, didn't achieve independence from Great Britain, like everyone else, right? Uh, until 1963. And at that point, they were really dependent on some simple cash crops, things like coffee, tea. They could just grow them, sell them for a profit. Uh, but by the time the 70s rolled around, the bottom fell out in that market. They were not getting a lot of money anymore for coffee and tea. They had to figure out something, and they figured maybe tourism is the way to go. There's a lot of people that want to see our country, or we could convince them to come see our country. But again, they don't have the money for this, otherwise they wouldn't have to do it in the first place. So they made some sweetheart deals with foreign companies. Come build tourist attractions, come build airports, things like that. Bring in the rich people. And of course the same thing happens. Those folks come in, uh, but most of the money that they spend on these endeavors goes right back to places like Great Britain that they just declared independence from in the first place. So nonetheless, they become dependent on this wealth, uh, what little of it there is. You know, the company's got them, how do I say this politely? It's got them. How about it's that? Got them. <laughs> so, what does this have to do with Game of Thrones, Dr. Dowd? What does it have to do with, doctor, uh, with Game of Thrones? Or Dr. Dowd. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, one thing, uh, I'll take the uh, clicker. You want that? The, Five dollars. It's become massively, Game of Thrones has become massively economically important uh, to, the, to the United Kingdom, of which it's a part, so much so that Queen Elizabeth uh, went to Titanic Studios for a tour. Um, the, when she was in uh, Northern Ireland. It's, it's kind of a, an interesting phenomenon. It, it, a, a side note to this, uh, when she was there, everyone, of course, wanted her to sit on the Iron Throne. You want to see that, don't you? I want to see that. And they invited her to, and she declined. 
Uh, tetanus. Because tetanus. there is actually a British law that prohibits the British monarch from sitting on a foreign throne. So I believe she just formally recognized Westeros as an actual country. Um, but she, uh, she did, she, there she is with Cersei is actually in that picture. Uh -oh. Uh, and Jon Snow is behind her. She's uh, not interested. <laughs> um, so it's become massively economic uh, influential. I mean, Game of Thrones has transformed their economy. Um, the, but now we got to start wondering about this kind of neo-colonialism. Is the money, if we trace the money a little bit, is, does this start stinking? They formed a company called Tourism Ireland. Um, and this is, we, we spent some time on this. It was formed by the government of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. It is a joint effort between the two countries to promote tourism to the island. Um, in this way, it avoids one of the traps that Dr. D.B.'s Carl was just talking about. It is not foreign investors. This is homegrown. Um, they realized they had something to make money off of, and Northern Ireland desperately needs money. Um, and they, they, they had a couple strikes against them historically with bringing in tourism and suddenly they had something. Uh, and so they did, however, partner with HBO. They cut a deal. Because it's not like they had a lot of infrastructure, they're not like they had a massive marketing campaign. They convinced HBO to help them make marketing materials and, and um, kind of viral marketing as well for tourism. They also uh, had cut a deal with HBO that HBO would leave the sets in Northern Ireland when the production is done. So they did prepare some print campaign, right? Like perfect for romantic getaways and red weddings, right? A uh, holiday that won't cost you an <coughs> arm and a head. <laughs> uh, winter is coming book now. So like some pretty typical things you might see in a magazine or on a billboard. But they, they wanted to do more than that because they recognized that when people were coming for the tours, they were not coming to be passive. They wanted to be active participants. That was one of the kind of things you mentioned as a goal of tourism. You want to participate in the thing you love. So they needed their marketing campaign to emphasize that, to make you feel like, I hate to say it, not that you're going to Ireland, but you're going to Westeros for vacation. So. HBO went around and put three-eyed ravens on various fake street signs telling you how to get to win Winterfell. Uh, somebody went out and actually put giant's footsteps in the sand on the beaches, just randomly. No signs for Game of Thrones, just giant footsteps. Um, they mounted three-eyed ravens in Belfast on park benches, and they took one of the skulls from the show of a dragon and just randomly put it on a beach. It helps, right? You like it, Brianna. Don't you? Wouldn't you be think? how cool is this if you went to the beach one day and there's a giant dragon skull? <laughs> cool? Mackenzie, cool? It's cool, but it, it reminds me of like Harry Potter World and like you would go to Disney for that, but it's strange because it's like in the middle of the country. Like it's not, you're not going to an amusement park and being like, I'm entering Harry Potter World. You're jumping ahead about 10 slides, Mackenzie. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Stop stealing our thunder. <laughs> uh, there is a difference, like you're right, like Harry Potter World seems to scratch the same itch, yeah. but that's, that's manufactured. This, these are real places, yeah. right? Okay. Um, in the uh, zoo in Belfast, they added dragon. They put a dragon into the zoo in Belfast. Uh, they didn't say anything about Game of Thrones. You just came across an animatronic dragon with a standard like z dragon, reptile. It tells you where it lives, what does it eat. Um, no explanation. Uh, and then my personal favorite, uh, in the museum, this is, uh, this is a piece of fine art that people love in the museum there. Uh, it's Fisher's Landscape with Sheep on the upper left. Uh, for part of the marketing campaign, they took down the actual painting and replaced it with a fake reproduction with a Game of Thrones giant in it and just put it in the museum. People loved it. Now if you were there and you were a Game of Thrones fan, aren't you going to go to the museum and check it out? And so somebody did make some profit off that, right? 
Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the dark hedges, the beautiful road with those trees, there was a, a horrible storm that knocked many of the trees down. And they're like, what, what do we do? Now, most of us would chuck the wood or turn it, turn it into something useful. They said, well, this is, these are Game of Thrones trees, right? And if we're looking to increase tourism and give people that sense that they could touch an authentic piece of Westeros, what if we hire somebody to carve doors out of the fallen trees and then we put them in pubs all around Ireland and say, you want to see the uh, Winterfell door? You go to this pub. You want to see, I think, uh, I'm not, I think this is the Targaryen door. You go to this pub. Mm -hmm. And they manufactured a little more tourism. You can go see what used to be a tree that you once saw on TV that is now a door in a backwater pub. People do it. And you can imagine how these link together then, because you don't want to just see one. No, you got to see all of them. Like, again, it's like Pokemon. You got to collect them all, gotta right? All. You got to go see them all. So what we're getting at here is that when it comes to tourism, the harm that's being done is not just economic, although that could be quite severe. I forgot to mention that uh, the profit leakage in Kenya was uh, estimated between 40 to 80 percent of the money generated by tourism goes to anyone but Kenyans. But some of the loss is not so easily quantifiable, and that's when we turn toward culture, toward a people's way of life, toward their, their language, their ideas, their beliefs, their practices. And there's been a long understanding that when you have powerful cultures coming into contact, co powerful wealthy countries, that is, coming into p contact with um, more marginalized ones, the loser is usually the poorer country. So we see this a lot with how we present or promote or think about these other places. Again, they're kind of exotic. Tourism tends to promote these caricatures of the host country. Doesn't offer a real full understanding of what it's like. We see these caricatures in media too, right? Like Aladdin, this kind of romanticization of what it's like in the Middle East. Uh, you get a lot of cultural education from that show? Probably not so much. I have precious few flying carpets in my garage. Uh, or we have uh, classical paintings like this. This is uh, Rosati's The Arrival, uh, where the women are coming to join the harem, uh, and it's seen as this other exotic, different place. So the foreign companies kind of cash in on this, because these are the only images we really see at home, and these are the sorts of things that we want to see abroad. Don't you want to see where Aladdin flew around? Uh, I don't know. You could probably see that. There's probably a t-shirt, I would imagine. Yeah. So in any case, uh, we get these kind of caricatures, but the actual culture, once you're there, becomes commodified as well. You could buy a piece of it. We see that with uh, collectibles like uh, Native American Kachina dolls, for example, right? Used to have religious uh, significance, not just something you buy on eBay that looks vaguely, quote unquote, Indian. Uh, and Uri argues that the stuff that it could actually be worse if you can't commodify culture in this way, if you can't turn it into a product to buy or sell to tourists, then it just gets lost entirely because it's not being remembered at all. So ultimately what these do is they don't give us that appreciation of the place we're visiting as an authentic way of life that's just as legitimate as ours. It's a caricature. Uh, our colonial ideology is reinforced that they are different in some way. And this maybe ties back to something you, you mentioned, Mackenzie, like they, they found a way to commodify tourism in Northern Ireland, but I suspect your issue is what they're selling isn't Irish culture, right? <laughs> it's Westerosi culture. So if I may borrow that, Absolutely. I'll give you your five bucks back. Sure. So let's look back at Kenya again, because we see the same sort of thing going on here, uh, where what's presented to you isn't necessarily the real Kenya. And in fact, it's not a neutral image either. This is a relatively recent advertisement inviting you to come visit. But here, Kenya is not presented as a, as a real place, much like the place you're in now. It's presented as sort of a magical wonderland full of exotic things that are different, that are simple, that are happy in some way. Uh, tourism here is largely based on meeting exotic animals and exotic people. And in fact, they kind of imply that they're not all that dissimilar. There's an element of racism going on here. You might see a Maasai in the wild or a cheetah, whatever, you know. Uh, and of course, then you want to buy the t-shirt. So uh, likewise, the diversity is downplayed. All we ever hear about or the Maasai, but there's about 40 other ethnicities in Kenya that we never hear anything about. So the Maasai are the only ones we see, uh, and they're actually not presented in a very humane way either. Again, they're these one-dimensional stereotypes. We don't actually get to know anything about them. They're seen as these happy, simple savages doing their jumpy dance uh, without any real context or understanding. They, they themselves become commodified in many ways. So let's look at New Zealand. This is a more recent case of this sort of thing. Uh, New Zealand is present, no, again, former colony, right? British again, those guys, they mm. keep busy. 
<laughs> so New Zealand is presented in a number of interesting ways as well. Frequently you see ads like this where it's again imagined as this empty, unpeopled place just full of nature. You could do whatever you want there. Uh, or when the natives are present, uh, again, they're not shown as fully human like you and I. They're seen as kind of simple, as potentially dangerous, as savage, as exotic, uh, but ultimately safe. They're there for your amusement, although they are exotic and different and savage. Uh, in fact, it's kind of like meeting a Disney character, right? A little different, a little weird, but basically just a cute and cuddly character, not a full 100% human being like you and I. So in this way, tourism allows for safe contact between the civilized tourist and the savage uh, indigenous native, as we see here, Prince Watsit uh, and some uh, ladies meeting. This is the traditional Maori greeting. You begin to wonder exactly how traditional this stuff is, uh, but it's something you could do. That probably costs about 10 bucks, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and of course, again, what this is ultimately reinforcing is the colonial ideology. We see the world in a dichotomy. Uh, the civilized on the left and the savage, the sophisticated, the primitive, the familiar, the exotic, the clothed, the naked. Uh, completely different in some ways. You don't learn appreciation, you learn the other. Now, in some ways, this is, uh, Ireland was ripe for this. And there's a few people who've had Irish literature with me in this room. Um, it came prefigured for this kind of appropriation, this imaginative appropriation. Ireland had been, in the British imagination, a gothic space for a long time. It was a pre-modern world uh, that was populated by fairies and ghosts and vampires and demons. And uh, it was, like New Zealand, it was largely envisioned as this, this unpopulated bogs and hills. Magical. As if the cities didn't exist. Uh, and, and so uh, Jarlith Colleen, a literary scholar, uh, described Ireland as a geographical zone which was defined as weird and bizarre. Uh, and so in some ways, I, it makes sense that people would seek this kind of cultural contact in Ireland, and it's been that way. And in literature, it has been inspiring this kind of fantasy worlds for a long time. Uh, Conan the Barbarian, created by Robert Howard in the 1920s, um, he envisioned Sumeria, the world Conan is from, as Ireland, and Conan as, as basically an Irishman. Middle Earth, uh, from Lord of the Rings by J.R.R. Tolkien, he, um, he was influenced by Celtic mythology and locations. In fact, this is a, another less popular tourist site you can go see called Polna Golem, which translates from the Irish as Gollum's Cave. Uh, so he even got the name of Gollum from, from the Irish. Uh, similarly, Narnia um, by C.S. Lewis. We all know C.S. Lewis, who was born in Northern Ireland, based Narnia on his imagination of, uh, his imagined kind of reinterpretation of the North Ireland uh, landscape. He said, Russ Striever, which overlooks Carlingford Loch, is my idea of Narnia. I yearn to see County Down in the snow. One almost expects to see a march of dwarfs dashing past. How I long to break into a world where such things are true. And his expression of that, how I long to break into a world where such things are true, seems so much the point of contemporary Northern Irish tourism. Now, the idea that people would be attracted to tourism based on a, a media production like a television show is not new, is not unique to Northern Ireland whatsoever. And I'm sure you've heard of some of these. Uh, the first ones that I heard of were the Sex in the City tour in New York City uh, and the Sopranos tour, which was like in New Jersey and New York, which would take you around to the actual locations featured in those shows, right? Uh, there is also in Albuquerque, you can go on a Breaking Bad tour, which sounds awesome. <laughs> but I think this is different, and I'm willing to argue about it. When you go on these tours, they're taking you to actual places that actually exist. It avoids what was making Mackenzie upset a couple of miles. If you go to Pizza Land, yes, it was in The Sopranos, but it is a real pizza shop. When you go on a Sex in the City tour and they take you to a specific like martini bar, uh, that place really exists. When you go on the Breaking Bad tour and they take you to Walter White's house, the house does exist. Walter White doesn't live there, but the house exists. So it seems different, seems different to me. 
And economically, too. This is great for them, right? A lot of people go to Mystic Pizza these days just because of the movie, right? That's true. That's true. Um, then it's, this also does not seem the same to me as the manufactured fan attractions. Harry Potter World. How many people, anybody been to Harry Potter? Okay. So you obviously wanted to go. But it, it was a manufactured attraction. Uh, and we've argued about this because I said it's purely, you said, it, well, it does erase the luxury of Orlando <laughs> no, <laughs> that I might have visited without a fan attraction. Well, again, we're forgetting who was there before Orlando. <laughs> correct, correct. So, uh, but it is, it seems different in that it is a purely manufactured environment. Um, they could have built this anywhere and you would have gone. Similarly, uh, there's been the Walking Dead experience, which tours where they recreate a zombie town. Has anyone done this? And like zombies chase you, Brianna, you want to do this? Zombies chase you and you have to like run away from the zombies, they're going to get you. Uh, and similar, there's been the Star Trek experience, which was originally, I think, in Las Vegas. Yes. And you get to sit on the bridge of the Enterprise. You can get, in Vegas, you could get married on the bridge of the Enterprise, which sounds great. It sounds amazing. Um, again, it doesn't seem like what's happening in Northern Ireland, so I'm, I'm not willing to accept this as the same thing. So what's the potential harm, Dr. Debes Carl? So you're right, Dr. Dowd, there are some differences here, and this is what we need to investigate further. So when we're talking about places like New Zealand uh, or Kenya and this kind of reimagining of them, we can see very simply that there are real people and real cultures being harmed, being ignored, or being characterized in some way. But what about these? What about a place like Westeros that doesn't really exist? What's the harm of wanting to visit there? We're not being disrespectful to Westerosi culture. It doesn't exist. Uh, and if you heard anybody get upset about that, you know, you might want to send them to some of my colleagues in the psychology department. But nonetheless, there is harm going on here, and the danger is that it is less transparent. We don't even know that we're being a part of it. In fact, there are real victims, there are real cultures at stake here, and the very fantasy that attracts us to the sort of tourism in the first place is what hides our notice of that. So the people that exist in places like Ireland, for example, uh, they could become a people without history, uh, that we don't really care about what they used to do when they lived there, we don't care about what they're doing now, and we don't care about what they're going to do in the future if indeed they have one at all. I should probably take that. <laughs> Would you be so kind? So let's just go back to New Zealand for a moment here uh, and consider how this plays a role. Again, you're probably familiar with the fact that New Zealand, since the Lord of the Rings movie, has become a very popular destination, even to this day, uh, for that sort of thing. In fact, I think the, the Hobbit movies probably reinvigorated interest in visiting it. But when you go on the Lord of the Rings tour, likewise, you're not really going to see New Zealand. You're missing it entirely. So here, you might be able to see this in the front row, maybe not in the back. This is a map of New Zealand, but these are not just the real places. You could go to Minas Tirith and Helmsdeep, Moria, Edoras, and so on down the line. When you're taking a walk in the countryside, you're not trying to see the New Zealand countryside. You're trying to see where Legolas stood by a tree. Uh, and the tourism promotion materials don't say, welcome to New Zealand. They say, welcome to Middle Earth. That's where you are now. You could completely ignore what's going on. Uh, but there are real people there. And in fact, many of them uh, did benefit economically from the film. The indigenous Maori, uh, many of them were actually cast as orcs. Uh, so in this case, you got to think about this a little bit then, right? Uh, they're hired to work on this film. They're reimagined as the bad guys. So anybody that's somewhat more darker of skin is reimagined as a villain in this predominantly white movie. So they're there, they're present in the Maori, uh, but they're not culturally present in any way. We've completely erased their existence by covering it up with an imagined one. In fact, uh, it's been said that um, through this sort of thing, the landscape in effect becomes a kind of tabula rasa, an open and blank slate on which film directors can project their image that they wish to create for fantasy films, and fans can insert themselves imaginatively as the participants in the fantasy world. That's what's going on here. So this idea of being culturally present is potentially the harm. Is Ireland being erased by Game of Thrones tourism? Is, is Westerosi culture replacing it? Fit, like physically, are people not even seeing or knowing the significance of Irish environments? Uh, this is a, in, for those of you who didn't already know, the map of Westeros itself is just Ireland turned upside down and England stacked on top of it. Um, so, uh, for instance, if, if uh, Galway in Ireland, if you turn it upside down, becomes King's Landing. Dublin becomes Lannisport. Um, so you can, you can even plot actual locations on the Irish map. 
that, uh, that work with uh, the real world map, but somehow they're being replaced. Is this kind of tourism sustainable? Because my biggest worry, if I am in charge of Tourism Ireland, is what? If 10% of my GDP by 2020 is going to be Game of Thrones tourism, what would be your biggest worry? Making sure people will stay interested in, in, uh, in this case, it'd be Game of Thrones if you're yeah. in charge of Ireland. Yeah. Well, of course, it's going to be on the television forever, right? Well, no. <laughs> oh, whoops. When's it leaving? Uh, soon. Sooner you know, than like later. It's got like yeah. two more seasons and it's done. That doesn't bode well for my tourism. And New Zealand worried about that. They were very excited when they heard about The Hobbit. Let's turn that into three movies. And they want to make the Cimmerillion oh, news to me. a movie too. Like they, we need you to generate more fictional culture to bring people for our real tourism. So they are worried about this. So what? they have to find a replacement. When Game of Thrones goes away, they need something new and it's already started. I wish we had dan, da, 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 right now, right? Star Wars. Star Wars, uh, uh, and I stole these from Irish tourism sites. It's a map of Ireland, great for Jedi Knights and families. <laughs> uh, Sith Lords and, and Solo Travelers. Oh, they, I get it, Solo Traveler. That's yeah, you adorable. Like that? Clever. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. They realize Game of Thrones is going away. They can't put all their eggs in one basket. We've got to start trying to generate some interest in other fictional tourism. They did try a little bit with Harry Potter, which filmed some scenes in, um, in Ireland, but nobody particularly cared about those scenes. Mm. And they tried with Chronicles of Narnia, the movies, uh, but again, it didn't catch. But this caught on, which is perhaps shocking, uh, because the scene was all of a minute. There was about a minute, maybe yeah, two minutes minute. of screen time in The Force Awakens that was filmed in Ireland. It's how many, everyone, has everyone seen The Force Awakens? So this is the end of the film. Spoilers. Everyone's still alive, don't worry. And uh, Ray lands on this uh, beautiful island in the middle of nowhere and um, Chewbacca says, stairs look tall, I'll stay here, you go on up alone. And she walks up the stairs, and she gets to the top, and she goes, hey, did you drop this? <laughs> and, and Luke Skywalker's like, what's up? Remember that scene? It was about a minute. That's about how I remembered it, yeah. They filmed that at Skellig Michael off uh, the Republic of Ireland's coast. And this, is, um, this was controversial when it happened. Skellig Michael is one of the few World Heritage sites located in Ireland. Um, you're not supposed to be there. Uh, tourism is, is not supposed to happen. It was an old Christian monastery, uh, very ancient. Uh, and the people were worried, you bring a film crew there, J just the film crew, you're risking potential damage to the site. But now, what happened, don't you want to go find Luke Skywalker yourself, Dr. Sloan? Don't you want to go to Skellig Michael? I mean, if Ray found him, you could go find him. So d you want to charter a boat, you want to get out there, and you want to climb the steps just like she did, right? Problem, because if you start bringing thousands of tourists to a World Heritage Site, we're, we're going to be in trouble. But that is basically what has happened. People have started going to Skellig Michael. They've had to give licenses for tours to try to limit the damage, but Without a doubt, the damage is happening. Um, during the off-season, when they can't give you permission to go onto the island, or if they don't have the license, they'll just drive you by it on a boat and point. Say, so Luke's right up there, wave. <laughs> right? Um, but they saw this. This was the potential. Star Wars is big, bigger than Game of Thrones. So we could turn this into tourism. And they were super excited. They were like, please come back in the next movie and film again. And this did cause some controversy uh, in Ireland because some people were not receptive of this site being used in that way. And so we start getting exciting photos like this. Once again, a fictional culture replacing the actual Irish culture. We, I, Danielle, I don't want you to go to Ireland to see Irish culture. You can go have a pint of Guinness with a stormtrooper, right? <laughs> I know.
right? The th we all kind of want this, right? So the ramifications start getting a little funky when we talk about this in Ireland. Um, even just the way that they are describing tourism in Northern Ireland occasionally makes me a little uncomfortable. Even at the same time, yeah, I kind of want to go. But at the same time, I see things like the real Westeros, which doesn't quite make sense. Um, Northern Ireland, the real Westeros. Welcome to the real world, Westeros. And if I'm going to send uh, um, a letter, apparently I'm going to slap a stamp on it. Greetings from Northern Ireland with the hand of the king, right? It, it, I'm starting to get a little uncomfortable at the blurring between the fictional culture and the real culture. So some of the r ramifications, and we're happy to talk about this further because we're, we're still, I think, working through some of these things yeah. on their own. There is the cultural worry. Uh, there's certainly appeal, but there's also tremendous economic benefit, which is why it's happening, right? Um, yeah, so they're und undeniably making money off of this. Is this really the same thing as what we were talking about? Is this Kenya? Because the money's actually staying put, or at least a significant amount of it. Yeah. And they have some control over this process, whereas the Kenyans really did not, right. New Zealanders really did not. So in a way, when they're, this culture is being destroyed, it's actually the Irish that are destroying their own culture. Yeah. But we're not really sure what to make of that. Yeah, Does that make it better? Does that make it worse? We can't look at it the same way as Kenya. Because they, they do have economic control, they do have power, and they're participating in this. They're benefiting directly from it, mm -hmm. and they're appealing to something people want. But at the same time, I'm feeling a little uneasy. I think you're feeling a little uneasy. Well, at the same time, wanting to go and do some of these trips. Mackenzie was feeling so uneasy, she laughed. Oh, early. no. <laughs> so, uh, Maybe she went to Ireland. She might have, <laughs> while it still exists. <laughs> Um, oh, it's like those uh, the glacier tours and things like that, right? Yeah. Uh, just last year, they're having all these uh, studied rich people on boats to go see the glaciers and things before they disappear. Before they're gone. And in the process, they're contributing to their destruction by driving those large boats through them. Who's going off to play a real sport in lacrosse? In Ireland. <laughs> so... <laughs> several of you started by saying you're Game of Thrones aficionados. Would you do the tour? Sam, you're like, yes. yes. Who cares about these Irish people? I care about the Irish people, okay. but I love you. <laughs> so I think if that was me, I would go do the tours, but then I would also support local, real Irish history. You know what I mean? I'm not sure I do. Well, like, I wouldn't go there just for Game of Thrones. Okay. Maybe for the Titanic and do the I'm the king of the world? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I'm an American, that would be an international trip, so I wouldn't just go for Game of Thrones. I would go because I want to. Yeah. Like, even with the, the, the Kenya thing, like, I wouldn't just go to go see the tourist stuff if you're only going to see the tourist stuff you're only getting. This right. is an interesting point you're making. So uh, in Ireland, yeah, you would probably have the ability to do that. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the same these days, but when they originally built up that infrastructure in Kenya, you actually didn't have a choice. The way it was built up, they kind of shuffled you off the plane, put you in a bus, and shipped you off to the hotel, and only the things they wanted you to see. Yeah. So in a way, they kind of took agency out of our hands. But you're right. In Ireland, you, the decision is up to you what you go see. Yeah, that, that is a major difference. So you could literally do the Game of Thrones tour on Monday, and on Tuesday, you could go tour authentic Irish locations? Guinness Factory. <laughs> <laughs> <Kinnis> Factory. <laughs> Not that that's like manufactured tourism or anything. No, I was going to say I would, uh, I would go to Ireland to see all the authentic uh, Norman colonial castles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's a place for it, right? So I think you're raising the issue, is all history fiction? You know, you look at the, the New Hampshire license plate and the New Hampshire Quarter, both of which feature the same icon, the old man of the mountain, mm. face in rock, yeah. which fell off yeah. in 2003. Yeah. And tourism went from 100,000 every summer to 70,000. Yeah, and, and to some degree, a lot of tourism depends, even in Ireland before Game of Thrones, depended on some narrative construction about, um, it might have been, instead of Game of Thrones, it might have been about, you know, 
Easter 1916 mm -hmm. and going to the post office and there's a narrative constructed around that. Or uh, you know a popular one is to go and do a Bloomsday in, in Dublin. You walk uh, Stephen Daedalus's trip from Ulysses. Um, it's still a narrative culture sitting on top of potentially authentic culture. Yeah, maybe there's degrees of real. I mean, you go to the bank and you could still see the bullet holes that happened. Yes, least, it did. You know. <laughs> yes, it did. We're happy to field questions and comments. Yeah, so you mentioned the um, pubs. Is there like one? Of, is there like a tour that you can take just to the pubs to visit? To all of them? Yeah, they would. Yeah, yeah, they'd be happy to take you around. You could visit on your own. There's lots of add-ons. So you can do the pubs, you can do lots of things that might be particularly interesting to you. It, from a marketing standpoint, it's smart. You take a broken tree and you turn it into a tourist attraction that's generating a lot of revenue for the local economy. And conversely... Not as far as I know. Not to my knowledge. No, not we really. We might need a grant to go research that, yeah. though. <laughs> I suspect. <laughs> we applied for that. We applied for that grant. They didn't give it to us. <laughs> Jake, um, do you think that this is like, especially in the like the developing world, uh, Kenya, for instance, would be better off without the tourism and having to rely on some sort of more I don't know, autarkic um, like economy that's agricultural and industrial, destroying a lot of the land, mm -hmm. they would. And then uh, just having, you know, closer to a homogenized Western global. I, I, yeah, like that's the. <laughs> yeah, you hit like the big problem. Like economic development in general is such a messy business. When you're in that situation, almost any strategy you choose is a catch 22. Right. You know, there's always going to be some sort of trade off. Apparently, the I mean, environmental least, devastation alone from that sort of thing. Yeah, at least with this, you know, they transmute something that's environmental pres preservation into sort of a, you know, a commercialized, like, commodity. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this is happening elsewhere as well. Game Good of Thrones point. films quite a bit in Croatia. Yeah. Uh, and they are starting to see a tourism boom there. And it's like, generally speaking, Croatia has not been a tourist destination. <laughs> uh, and suddenly it's getting tourists. And it'd be hard to say, put aside that tourism money that you could use. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the catch-22. Uh -huh. The last time I went to Ireland, which was two Aprils ago, it seemed, you know, we stayed in um, B&Bs and hotels, and it seemed like all of the hotels had foreigners working in them, not Irish, and the Irish people do not like that. And I think that is because of the economy, or I'm not sure why, but yeah. um, the Irish people, how do they feel about, you know, how would they feel about this? Um. It's, I think it's divided. There's some people, I imagine if you're one of the 5,700 people who got a job mm. because of Game of Thrones, you're feeling okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's mixed feelings even for the individuals. The uh, slide we saw with uh, the Maori who were employed, for example, many of them are kind of famous as going on the record being both happy and upset about it. Uh, the, I'm poor about remembering stars' names, but the one guy says these sorts of things all the time. He makes fun of his role. Uh, and what it did to him, but he's simultaneously proud of it. I imagine it's sort of like that. Even the same person could feel conflicted over these things. Yeah, because I know the Irish, you know, from hanging out in pubs and whatnot, yeah. they are not pleased with the influx of foreigners working in their hotel. Well, and it, it even comes across in St. Patrick's Day, right? A lot of the St. Patrick's Day celebrations in Ireland now are performance for tourism. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't, that's not how St. Patrick's Day was celebrated. <laughs> It is a performance of Irishness performed by Irish people for people who are tourists, um, which again is a, one of these layers of quasi-culture. <laughs> yeah, there's a blurry. I mean, I do think it's possible to have like kind of try to preserve the history as well as like feed into tourist attractions. Like I know Oxford University um, like has that going on. Like you can go. And they can either say, oh, well, do you want to take a Harry Potter tour to see where they 
film, or do you want to um, learn about like the hundred year history behind the university? And right. When I went on both, like they had the same amount of people, but I think it takes like a lot of effort and a lot of focus to get there. So. Um, and a lot of willpower of the tourist. Yeah. <laughs> Which vacation tourism is not usually a time where you're supposed to have a lot of willpower, right? Yeah. <laughs> like I'm going to educate myself. There's a lot of consumer-driven demand. You see a similar process in a lot of tours these days. We were just talking to a colleague of ours, actually. He was discussing the uh, tunnels, in, uh, or is it in, not Seattle, where they used to Shanghai oh, Portland. people? Portland. Portland. Uh, and if you take that tour of the underground ca you know, caves and things, where they used to kidnap people and ship them overseas, uh, you could either take the historical tour, or you could take the ghost tour. And it depends on what the group as a whole wants. And regardless of which one you want, I'm thinking about, what about the person that's on that tour that wants like one tour, but everybody else wants the other, you know? Yeah. What's that experience like? They need new friends. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't necessarily even have to go too far to see these sorts of things. It's, it's becoming a trend all over. Yeah. You had your hand up. Yeah, I was, I was actually I was thinking, um, it's similar to my last question, but it's more for the developed world. With the, um, I guess with the developed world and its kind of um, homogenization of culture and the sort of you know, mass market, like consumers' culture and the you know, secular humanist ideas. A lot of these, you know, so-called Irish culture or, um, I don't know, Croatian or uh, British culture, I mean, that's, it's pretty much dying. And it's dying to, um, you know, obviously young people don't want to go to church anymore. They don't want to carry on traditions. And so, you know, without these sorts of tourism, like how is that culture actually otherwise going to remain alive? If it's not like, once again, sort of, commoditized or whatever into something that people feel alive again rather than being like you know ashes of history like you know you know people talk about okay well colonialism was bad let's have you know mass uh, like immigration to various you know different countries especially to the west you know those places aren't going to survive with you know mass you know, immigration and no culture that actually sort of supports the traditions yeah. expanding traditions. Yeah, the arguments about uh, cultural homogenization were, were really popular in the 90s in particular, had like Lexus and the Olive Tree and stuff like that, or they th especially they thought that there's going to be like this American monoculture that was going to dominate the planet. And um, what we actually see happening these days is kind of the opposite, a resurgence of local cultures where people note this risk. Uh, but in a way, what was lost um, isn't lost, right? Cultural ch culture is not this thing that can never change. So whatever English culture is right now is English culture, whether or not it, that's what it was 200 years ago. But what's weird is this reimagining, including this kind of valorization of tradition that we saw with this like protection of the local, is kind of like a simulation. In a way, that might be the real threat, yeah, as opposed to like whatever immigration or whatever these other things are doing to culture. At least that's a natural process. So uh, again, ongoing debate. There's some really interesting stuff going on in the literature right now in that regard, mm. Mm. including possibly why the micro beer movement has taken off so much in the face of the Budweisers, right? <laughs> why drink a Budweiser when you could get your two road saison or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the Irish are very aware of preserving their culture too. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, they want Thank us you. to chat. We're <laughs>